Our second example is also a Dinos, and it's known as the Wedding of Thetis and Peleus by the painter known as Sophilos. Now, for those of you who need a reminder, Thetis is the mother of Achilles, and she famously married the mortal Peleus. And at this wedding, the goddess of discord Eris was not invited. And as a way of getting her revenge, she throws the golden apple amongst the guests, and of course, it's got the famous words for the fairest on. And in a room full of gods and goddesses, that's never a good idea and it's this that leads to Paris the Trojan prince having to choose between Athene, Hera and Aphrodite and of course he chooses Aphrodite as the fairest because she promised him Helen the most beautiful woman in the world so this is the origins of the Trojan war and it's one of the stories in that epic cycle so that's what we're looking at on the top band there. We've got one band of narrative, just like we did with the Gorgon vase. And then we've got two bands of what we refer to as orientalizing pattern, where we have floral designs such as palmettes, and we have mythological and exotic animals. Now, whilst we're looking at this image of the whole vase, one thing that will be standing out to you is the use of colour by Sophilos. There's much more variety in colour than we saw on the Gorgon's vase. So, of course, we've got that standard black slip, but this time we've got the use of white slip as well to differentiate between males and females. So we're seeing something similar there in terms of gender ideals in art, as we did with our sculpture, where the women tended to be sculpted in the paler marble and the men were applicable in the bronze. You'll also note that we've got the use of red slip. So notably for the drapery or the cloaks of some of our individuals on the top narrative scene, but also for some of our mythological creatures and animals below. And looking at it in its entirety, there looks like there's even more colours than just those three because Sophilos has been so skilled in the way that he painted them. Now, we're going to start looking at what we can see in our narrative band at the top together. But I just want to explain, first of all, what exactly is happening. So on that right hand side at the top with his drinking cup, his cantharos in hand is Peleus. And we know it's Peleus because we've got a little inscription next to each figure on this vase that tells us who they are. These are known as Dipinti. Uh, and he's standing in front of his house and he's welcoming his guests. And something that I particularly like about this vase is that we can see just inside one of the columns to his house, we've got an inscription there in Greek. And this translates as Sophilos made me. So sometimes our painters like to make sure we know exactly who has painted this particular scene. But here it's been added in a really nice innovative little way between the door and the column. Okay, so let's start thinking about who's coming to this particular wedding. And I'm going to not, not go through absolutely everybody, but point out some individuals of interest, but also think about how people are arranged and how people are paired, because that's the one of the most uh, innovative aspects of this particular vase. So first up, we can see Iris, who is our female messenger god. Um, we can also pick out Dionysus in that scene because he's wearing his wreath around his head, his ivy wreath, and he's also carrying um, the vine in his hand. Behind him, it's just worth pointing out, because look at the beautifully designed drapery, Hebe, and we've even got Chiron, our famous centaur behind Hebe, who trains our heroes. But what I like mostly about this procession is that people have been put in pairings. Uh, and what I mean by that is that husbands and wives are seen arriving together in chariots or in some occasions lovers. So in this first chariot that you can see in the scene we're now looking at, you've got Zeus and Hera. And in the second chariot, we've got Poseidon and his wife Amphitrite. We've also, in a third chariot, if we carried on looking behind there, got Ares and Aphrodite. So Aphrodite has chosen to be with her boyfriend as opposed to her husband, not, not surprisingly, who's at the back. And we shall have a look at Hephaestus. Uh, he's kind of right at the back of the procession with a donkey. Poor Hephaestus. Um, and in between these 
pairings in the chariot, we've got groups such as the graces, the fates, the muses. So I really do like those particular groupings. Uh, and the fact that it's married couples and lovers who are grouped together just seems really, really applicable for a wedding scene. Those that haven't got a natural plus one, I always quite enjoy looking at as well. So we have at one point Athene and Artemis together, our two virgin goddesses have decided to go as each other's plus one. But my absolute favourite pairing is this one that you're looking at now, Hermes and Apollo. And they just look like they are having such a good time. So Hermes is controlling the chariot. He's in charge there. We can see him holding the reins. Apollo has his lyre in his hand. So these two are actually listening to music as they travel to the wedding. And Apollo's mouth is slightly open. So he's actually singing. And I just think, what a wonderful way to arrive at a wedding. And then right at the back, I mentioned we would all feel very, very sorry for Hephaestus. So he's our final uh, person right there at the end with a donkey. Right, the reference to the donkey. Well, in mythology, he was famously taken <clears throat> back up to Mount Olympus by Dionysus traveling on a donkey. So it does link to that particular piece of mythology. Uh, but sadly, Hephaestus can quite often be grouped together with subhuman creatures um, in, in art to reference the way the Greeks saw him as a bit of an outsider god, sadly due to his disability. So he might be very quick-witted uh, and clever, for example, in, in the Odyssey, you know, when he catches Ares and Aphrodite in bed, but kind of physically is seen as inferior to some of the other gods, for example, Ares. Finally, one other thing that I just wanted to point out about this particular um, narrative or, or even the style of the piece is the way in which the anatomy again is shown in this archaic period. We've again got the long fingers and the long toes. Uh, actually, you can see them also on Hebe and Dionysus and on Peleus. So very typical to have those elongated uh, digits in the archaic period. It's also very typical to have our figures in side profile, but with the eye looking out at the viewer. So it's a kind of a frontal eye. Uh, and this is something that was influenced by, of course, the Egyptians in their paintings. And you'll notice as well that there's not much of an emphasis on trying to, to paint the anatomical form or the body. Most of our figures just give the impression of a body beneath that drapery. <laughs> 